Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. I hope that you can hear me. Um, it's one o'clock on my watch, so I think we can start with the webinar. Okay, just a few things. Uh, because it's a webinar, you won't be able to unmute yourself, so you can only use the, the chat box. Um, I know at the moment that you can only see uh, the presentation, not even presentation mode, so let me quickly check. Um, it seems like the right screen is showing now. Um, so, yeah. Uh, because it's a webinar, like I said, you can only use the chat box and you can't ask any questions um, on the mic. So uh, I'm probably not going to be able to look at the chat box as often while doing the presentation. Um, but I do know there's a lot of people in this call that's probably going to have a lot of uh, knowledge on insecticide resistance management as well. Um, so please do ask your questions in there and um, maybe there's someone that will answer that has more knowledge. Otherwise, you are welcome to contact me after the, the webinar and then I will uh, send you a reply. Um, my contact details will be provided at the end of the webinar. Okay. Um, yeah, so welcome today to the webinar. Thanks for attending. Uh, my name is Lilian and I'm the Regulatory Manager at CropLife. Um, the reason I, I feel like I can give you some info on sector side resistance management is that I'm currently the chair of IREC South Africa. Um, probably not for long, but yes, uh, there's a lot of people, like I said, also on the call that will have a lot of knowledge on insecticide resistance management. So uh, please start a conversation if there's anything you want to add to what I'm saying or if you want to um, make any comments please do that in the chat box. Okay so I think the first place to start is the registration of agricultural remedies in South Africa. So all agricultural remedies in South Africa needs to be registered under Act 36 of 1947 at the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development. So when we register an agricultural remedy at the department, we need to demonstrate, amongst other things, efficacy of the product. Efficacy needs to de be demonstrated for every crop and space combination that you list on your label. Although there's no specific value indicated to register uh, an insecticide in South Africa, generally we wouldn't um, register a product if your control in the field is less than 80%. Uh, so we say a minimum of 80% of control of the target pest species should be considered. Okay, so what is IRAC? IRAC is part of CropLife, and in South Africa, that would be CropLife South Africa, if we're talking about IRAC South Africa, and it stands for the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. So under the umbrella of CropLife, we have IRAC, FRAC, and ATRAC. FRAC is for fungicide resistance management, and ATRAC for herbicide resistance management. In South Africa, we have working groups and people from industry sitting on all of these working groups to monitor and combat resistance development. Okay, so the question is, what is insecticide resistance? So resistance is a heritable change in the sensitivity of a pest population that is reflected in the repeated failure of a product to achieve the expected level of control when used according to the label recommendation for that pest species. So in essence, it's that the product is no longer providing the expected efficacy. So resistance occurs through mutations in the genetic makeup of the insect. And as insect mutations occur, 
On occasion, these mutations may result in the insect becoming less susceptible to an insecticide and then provides a competitive advantage to that insect against the particular insecticide. So if the same insecticide mode of action is used repeatedly, these resistance insects can become dominant in the population. So insecticide resistance is a natural occurrence and it's part of natural processes of evolution and adaptation. So how would insecticide resistance become a problem? So in most cases, mutations are random and a resistance mutation may not have much of an impact on the population. However, if a specific mutation exists to make to provide a competitive advantage to an insect, the insect with the mutation continues to live and reproduce like other insects. And if that insecticide is applied on which the mutation has no effect, both the susceptible and resistant insects would be controlled. However, if an insecticide is applied on which the mutation has an effect conferring resistance to the insect, only susceptible insects will be controlled and resistant individuals would remain and reproduce. If the resistance mutation is heritable, the offspring will also have that resistance mutation. Consequently, when the same insecticide is spread consecutively, the insects which carry that resistance mutation survive and will become more frequent in the population. So to give a more graphic representation to make sense of it, so our green insect is susceptible to the insecticide and then we have the yellow ones that has a resistance mutation conferring resistance to a specific insecticide. So if we spray these insects with the insecticide that those yellow insects have become resistant to, then only the green ones would be controlled and the yellow ones would reproduce and survive. So how does this become a problem? So if we continue to use the same insecticide over and over again, then only then insects, the insects that are resistant will be will not be controlled by the insecticide application. So continued application of the same insecticide will result in those resistant insects becoming dominant in the population and the insecticide spray becoming less efficient because resistant insects will keep on reproducing and will carry over the resistant gene into the next generation. So this is just another example showing pretty much what I showed earlier. Uh, so you would have um, one insect in the population maybe carrying a, mu a, a gene, a mutation that allows it to reproduce and survive the specific insecticide mode of action. And then after insecticide application, it will survive and continue to reproduce. If the second spray is the same mode of action, then we'll get more of those insects that are resistant. And if you continue this indefinitely, then most of the population will have become resistant against that specific insecticide. So obviously we need to pre prevent insecticide resistance development. So to prevent insect pests with a resistance mutation from becoming, becoming dominant in a population, insecticides with different modes of action should be used in sequence or rotation across insect generations. This will slow the selection process and delay resistant insects from increasing in frequency in the population. The more frequently the same insecticide is used, the faster resistance the resistance mutation will be selected and the more resistant individuals will be in the population. So using insecticides with different mode of actions relies upon the insect being susceptible to at least one or more of the insecticides being used in the program. 
So obviously, if you're applying um, in our previous example, it was the yellow insecticide. If different insecticides that is used um, that has the same mode of action, then that insect will still not be controlled. So we assume that the insect needs to be susceptible to at least one of our insecticides that we use in our spray program. So this is called insecticide resistance management. So how does this work? So essentially, if you use um, one insecticide mode of action and you have insects in your population that have a resistance mutation and will survive that specific insecticide application, if we, in our next application, use an insecticide with a different mode of action, and we will come to explaining exactly what the mode of action means, um, if we use an, uh, an insecticide with a different mode of action, then we assume, hopefully, um, that the resistant individual that survived the application of the previous insecticide will be susceptible to the mode of action that we use thereafter. And that will control then our resistant individuals and prevent these resistant individuals from becoming dominant in the population. So the previous example we showed was rotation of um, different mode of action insecticides. And we can also do resistance management by making use of insecticide mixtures. So if you have two insecticides with different modes of actions that you apply at the same time that targets the same insect, then we can also have resistance management and eliminate individuals that are resistant to both those active ingredients with the other insecticide that is used in conjunction with that one. So before we continue, I think we should just stand still a bit on insecticide mixtures because it's not as straightforward. Usually insecticide mixtures are formulated for pest control management, not necessarily resistance management. So it would usually target two different pests or it would target two different life stages of the pest, etc. So um, in most cases, it's not for resistance management, but for pest management. However, mixtures can provide technical advantages for controlling pests in a broad range of settings, typically by increasing the target pest control and broadening the range of pest controls. Mixtures may, however, offer benefits for insecticide resistance management when appropriately incorporated into rotation strategies with additional modes of action. But then, if uh, mixtures are used, we cannot rely on a single mixture um, to be used throughout the spray program. So important things to consider when we're using insecticide mixtures. Individual insecticides selected for use in mixtures should be highly effective and be applied at the rates at which they are individually registered for use against the target pest. So uh, something that can also contribute to resistance development is exposing an insect to sublethal concentrations of the active ingredient. So therefore, we should always have the, the correct rates and also application volumes so that the, the pest is not exposed to sublethal concentrations. And mixtures with components having the same IREC mode of action classification cannot be used for insecticide resistance management. Also, when using mixtures, we have to consider any known cross-resistance issues between the individual components for the target pest. And we'll come back to explaining exactly what cross-resistance means. Mixtures become less effective if resistance is already developing to one or both of the active ingredients, but they may still provide best management benefits. The insecticide resistance management benefits of an insecticide mixture are greatest if the two components have similar periods of residual insecticidal activity. Mixtures of insecticides with unequal periods of residual insecticide activity may offer an insecticide resistance management benefit for the period where both insecticides are active. 
So uh, the residual insecticidal activity is the period of time for which the insecticide is active after applying it. Okay, so I have a, a video that I want to play um, and I'm hoping it's going to work. Uh, just give me a second, then I'm just going to try and see if it works. Okay, my colleagues Huresh and uh, Alriza can, I think, talk to me. Uh, so I'm going to play it now. Elriza, Hiresh, please let me know if it's not working and if you can't hear the sound. Um, okay, sorry, it seems like the sound is not working. I'm just going to try and share it again. I did say includes computer sound. I'm going to try one more time, and if it's not working, then we'll just skip the the video. Crop Life International and the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee explain how to combat insecticide resistance. This farmer is called James. He loves his job and is very proud of his produce. To avoid insect damage to his crops, James has always used the same insecticide and never had a problem. This year, James is worried because his crops are infested and spraying his fields does not kill many of the insects. If this continues, the whole harvest could be destroyed. James can't understand why the insecticide that worked so well before is not working so well now. An insecticide loses its effect because the insects have developed resistance to it. In any population of insects, there is genetic variability. The variability may give some insects a natural protection from this insecticide. If the same insecticide is always used, only insects that have this advantage survive. These resistant insects reproduce and pass on their advantage. Over time, this selection process fills the fields with resistant insects that are not affected by the insecticide. Luckily, there are other insecticides that have different modes of action. This means they attack the insects in different ways. Great, but how can we stop the process repeating and new types of resistance developing? Researchers carried out studies that show that by spraying insecticides with different modes of action in rotation throughout the crop growing season, the insects are controlled and the chance of resistance developing is greatly reduced. James can find information about what mode of action an insecticide uses printed on many bottles, online or by asking the retailer. All insecticides with the same number share the same or a similar mode of action. So James makes sure to pick ones with different numbers. The rotation of chemical insecticides is an important element of an integrated approach to combating resistance, along with non-chemical practices like pest monitoring, crop rotation, soil tillage, and the encouragement of predators. James is delighted. By rotating insecticides with different modes of action and by implementing integrated pest management practices, he has solved his insect problem in a sustainable way. This saves him money by increasing his yield and improving the quality of his produce. James also finds he does not need to apply insecticides regularly and has more free time with his family. Farmers like James are not alone in the fight against insecticide resistance. In urban environments, mosquitoes can also develop resistance. This increases the spread of malaria and has a huge impact on public health. Iraq works everywhere to combat the development of resistance. If you would like to learn more about insecticide resistance and the work of Iraq, 
visit the IRAC website. Okay, cool. I'm glad it worked. Uh, let's just get back to our presentation. I oh, know that's the wrong one. Okay, I think you should be able to see the presentation again. Uh, please let me know if you can't. Okay, so that was just a short video to explain it. I think it's a bit easier to see with all of the nice pictures. And um, yeah, I hope it makes sense. And so I will delve a bit more into the mode of action and how exactly resistance management works. So as was explained on the video, usually the mode of action of the insecticide is presented on the label on the packaging of the insecticide. So all insecticides are classified according to a specific mode of action, which is the way in which the product works to kill the insect. Currently, there are more than 30 different insecticide mode of action groups, but not all groups are necessarily available in all countries. Some insecticides have an unknown mode of action, and these groups will contain a UN in the mode of action description. But we'll uh, look at that in more detail a bit later too. So where can we find the mode of action other than on the, the packaging of the insecticide? So this is the IRAC website, if you haven't used it before. So on the IRAC website, you can go to mode of action and you can go find any insecticide uh, active ingredient and you can search for the specific mode of action of that active ingredient on IRAC's website. In addition, there's also an IRAC app, so you can download it and also search for all of the different active ingredients on the app. Yeah, you might have seen this uh, also. It's the poster with different um, insecticides and their mode of action classifications. Um, often we, we print it and put it in areas uh, like uh, distributors, uh, in in depots. Uh, so yeah, you can also get this on the IREC website if you want to print it and put it up somewhere. Okay, so the first thing for resistance management is to know the mode of action of the insecticide that you're using. So in South Africa, the mode of action group is displayed on the front panel of the label. And uh, just to give you an example, in the example seen on the screen at the moment, you can see it's oximal and it's categorized into um, classification 1A. So group one, that is the mode of action classification. So you usually look at the, the number and not the letter. So the, the but we will, <laughs> I will explain it in more detail a bit later. So number one is your mode of action group, and that means the insecticide belongs to acetyl cholinesterase inhibitors, and A refers to the subgroups, which is carbamates. So this is what our product labels look like. I know this might look new to some people because at the moment we are changing to GHS classification and it won't ha have the color band anymore. Um, but the mode of action group will still be in the same place. So you will see on the front panel of the label, it says IREC insecticide group code and it will have its group code in the middle. Okay, so just looking at labeling, um, sometimes an insecticide will have more than one code listed on the product label. So what does this mean? So where a product has two or more active constituents, and these are presented by two or more modes of action, there will be two or more appropriate mode of action identifier letters or numbers in a single statement. If the product contains two or more active constituents which perform different functions, for example, an insecticide and a fungicide, each function will be shown separately. That is one indicator panel for the insecticide and another for, for the fungicide component. So on the right hand side, you can see sometimes if we have mixtures, so the example here is herbicides, then there will be two 
mode of action groups listed for both active ingredients that are included in the mixture. But sometimes you'll have one compound and it will act as both an insecticide and, for example, a fungicide. And then it will list both group codes because it will have an insecticide group code and a fungicide group code. So to give you an example, Flupirum, for example, is classified as both a fungicide and an insecticide. And therefore, on the label, you will see that it has an insecticide mode of action of 25 and a fungicide mode of action as category 7. In the examples below, you will also have two um, insecticide groups, but this is because it's a mixture of two insecticides. So uh, in the first example, you have a group 6 insecticide, imamectin benzoate, and a group 15 insecticide, lufeniron. And in the other one, you have a 3A and 1B chemical both in the same product. So in addition to the mode of action that's displayed on the front panel of the label, you also have a resistance warning on the in the text of the label under the heading resistance warning or resistance management. And in this script, you will also list the IRAC mode of action group code. So there's some deviations on some of the labels for the exact text included, but usually uh, it looks like this and it says uh, what active ingredient is in the formulation and its group code. And then it will say to not exclusively use that product with the same mode of action. And there will also be um, resistant individuals in the population naturally. And to allow them to not become dominant in the population, you have to use application windows and rotate products with different mode of action groups, which we will also discuss in more detail. Okay, so multiple applications of the same mode of action insecticide are only acceptable if they are used within the same application window. Okay, so before we continue to application windows, uh, let's look at what is a subgroup. So as explained before, if you have a, a, a mode of action classification, for example, for oximal, that is classified in insecticide group 1A, 1 would be the mode of action group and A would be the subgroup. So the, the subgroup represents distinct classes of insecticides that have the same mode of action, but they are different in structure or mode of interaction with the target protein. So the subcategorization differentiates between closely related insecticides and reduces selection for either metabolic or target site cross resistance which we will explain a bit later on. So the cross resistance potential, so maybe I should stop there. So cross resistance would mean if you're applying one chemical and then use of that chemical also confers resistance to another chemical. So the cross resistance potential between subgroups is much higher than between groups. Thus rotation between subgroups should in general be avoided. So that means if you look at the 1 and the A, you would rotate between um, different uh, numbers and not different letters, as the letters are the subgroups. So to just go into a bit more detail, so I'm um, going back to the example that we used. So group 1, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are grouped into 1A and 1B. 1A is the carbamates and 1B the organophosphates. So both of them belong to mode of action group 1. However, um, the carbamates and organophosphates, although having the same mode of action, will be a little bit different in the way that they act and therefore they fall within subgroups. However, the chances of carbamates or organophosphates um, developing resistance because of the use of the other compounds that's in the same group are higher than the chances of you using different insecticide mode of action groups. So um, to go into more detail on the mode of action, um, you will see on this 
poster, most of the chemicals are classified or categorized according to a specific color. So the color refers to the main mode of action, how most insecticides work. So it's these three, nerve and muscle, growth and development, respiration, mid-gut, or unknown or non-specific. You will see that most of the chemicals listed here fall in the nerve and muscle category. Okay, so as mentioned, the use of groups. Uh, so usually you would rotate between different groups and the use of subgroups are not... Um, recommended for rotation because of the likelihood of cross resistance developing. Okay, so um, looking at the mode of actions, we have a few categories that are a bit different than other categories. So group eight is non-specific mode of action or multi-site inhibitors. And unlike other insecticides, Non-specific or multi-site inhibitors do not act on a distinct target, but likely disrupt a variety of important physiological functions. So they don't just have one way of killing the insect, they usually have multiple ways. In addition, we get unknown mode of actions. So these compounds um, may act on a distinct target site, but the mechanism of action has not been conclusively determined. Uh, so you'd see it's fungicides or bacterial agents, etc. Okay, so um, an exception, rotation within groups are sometimes possible. So when we look at group eight, that's non-specific or multi-site inhibitors, or for example, the unknown um, classification that we've now looked at, um, because we assume that those um, mode of actions, even though they're in the same mode of action group, they would have different mode of actions to control the best. So in this case, for these groups, you can rotate chemicals with the same mode of action because they work differently, even though they fall within the same group. We don't believe that they share a common target site. Okay, so in short, what is an insecticide mode of action? It is the mode of action that defines the process of how an insecticide works on an insect or mite at a molecular level. So how it kills the insects. So just to look in a bit more detail exactly what this means. So on the poster, we saw that we have various different modes of actions. And the most common one was nerve and muscle. So most current insecticides act on the nerve and muscle targets, and insecticides that act on these targets are generally fast-acting, like the pyrethroids, for example. Then we get insecticides that um, affect the growth of the insect. So this is usually like insect growth regulators, um, and it, it prevents the insect from molting often. Um, so it, it delays growth of the insect. Such insect growth regulators are generally slow to moderately slow acting. Then we get insecticides that affect the respiration of the insect. And this is usually at the molecular level, level at a mitochondrial respiration and inhibition of electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation. And this is also usually moderately fast acting or fast acting. Then we get uh, insecticides that affect the mid-gut of the insect, lepidopterin specific usually, um, and they are sprayed or expressed in transgenic crop varieties. So the most common one um, that most people will know is Bt that's also incorporated into biotech crops. Yeah, and then the ones that we've mentioned previously is unknown or non-specific mode of action. So several insecticides are known to affect less well-described target sites or functions or to act non-specifically on multiple targets. 
So that's the five main ways in which insecticides used to kill their targets. So why is it important to understand the mode of action? So if we think of insect growth regulators, for example, these compounds affect insect growth and development. Consequently, they are only effective against juveniles as adults are no longer growing or molting and therefore will not be controlled. When we don't understand the mode of action, for example, in the case of insect growth regulators, you might incorrectly assume that it's resistance development. However, it's just the compound does not work on that insect if it's already an adult. So how do insects develop resistance? So there are a few main um, modes in which resistance develop. The first one and most common one is metabolic resistance. So resistant insects may detoxify or destroy the toxin faster than susceptible insects or quickly rid their bodies of the toxic molecules. Metabolic resistance is the most common mechanism and often presents the greatest challenge. Insects use their internal enzyme systems to break down insecticides. Then we get target site resistance. The target sites where the insecticides act in the insect may be genetically modified to prevent the insecticide binding or interacting at its sites of action, thereby reducing or eliminating the pesticidal effect of the insecticide on the insect. We can also get penetration resistance. So resistant insects may absorb the toxin more slowly than susceptible insects. Penetration resistance occurs when the insect's outer cuticle develop barriers which can slow absorption of the chemical into their bodies, and this can protect the insect from a wide range of insecticides. Penetration resistance is frequently present along with other forms of resistance. The last one is behavioral resistance, which is less common, but resistant insects may detect or recognize the danger and avoid the toxin. So this mechanism of resistance has been reported for several classes of insecticides and the insect may simply stop feeding if they come across certain insecticides or leave the area where spraying occurred. This has been, exa for example, been um, documented for things like termites and cockroaches, etc. So this is a schematic um, diagram of the, the main mechanisms of resistance development and um, so you can see sometimes it can be on the cuticle of the insect and the pesticide cannot enter the insects. Several of the modes of action act inside the insect either um, metabolizing it quicker the insecticide or excreting it and um, it can also have target site modification uh, where the insecticide can no longer bind to the protein that it's supposed to affect. So of the modes of actions uh, of resistance development, so the two main um, resistance development mechanisms are metabolic resistance, where the insect um, breaks down or sequester the insecticide, or target site resistance where we get mutations of the target proteins and the insecticide can no longer bind to the protein. Okay, we've mentioned a few times cross resistance. Uh, we haven't yet uh, looked at multiple resistance. Okay, so the mode of action classification is designed to help growers identify different modes of action in order to avoid repeated use of similar insecticides and select for resistance. But this is based on the most common observation, which is that there is cross resistance within a mode of action group, but not between mode of action groups. So if we look at the example of uh, group one and two, so group one is divided into A and B, and group two is divided into A and B. So we would um, easily get cross resistance between 
um, group 1A and group 1B or cross resistance between group 2A and 2B, but we won't easily see cross resistance between group 1 and group 2. So cross resistance is defined as resistance to two or more insecticides via a single mechanism of resistance. So cross resistance within a mode of action group, um, like we said, this is the most common. However, there can be differences in the level of resistance between insecticides, even within the same mode of action group, which is called partial cross resistance. And in very rare cases, there may be no cross resistance within a group, but this is often only restricted to a single pest. We do also sometimes get cross resistance between mode of action groups. However, this is fairly rare, but um, in cases we have similar molecule, molecular structural components or um, something is metabolized by a single enzyme, then this could happen. And just in a schematic way, cross resistance is protection from two or more insecticides through a single mechanism. So you have one mechanism, but it confers resistance and protection from more than one insecticide. So this is different to multiple resistance. So multiple resistance is resistance to two or more insecticides via multiple mechanisms of resistance, not just one, which is in the case of cross resistance. And it's often confused for cross resistance. So if you think of the example that we gave earlier with, um, with cross resistance for multiple resistance, protection from two or more insecticides are provided through multiple mechanisms. Okay, so the question is, how do we delay insecticide resistance development? Okay, and I think uh, I have another video to share, so I'm going to hope it's going to work this time. Let's say uh, stop and restart it. Um, Just check if I include computer sound. Okay, please let me know if you can't hear the sound. We explain the importance of using mode of action in insect resistance management. Bruno grows a range of vegetables on his farm using insecticides to control pests. However, this isn't a simple task. Recently, one of the products he'd successfully used for a long time stopped being effective. The insects are now flourishing and destroying his crops. So Bruno speaks to his local agriculture advisor, Anna. She explains that insecticides can work in different ways. They can have a different mode of action. Repeated use of the same insecticide leads to insects developing resistance against that mode of action, making them hard to control. As a solution, Anna recommends an alternative product with a different mode of action to control the pests. She strongly advises Bruno to vary the insecticides he uses in order to combat resistance. This sounds sensible to Bruno, but how does it work? Insecticides can be grouped by mode of action based on their site of action within an insect. Prevention or management of resistance is normally achieved by varying insecticide modes of action during the growing season. This is known as rotation or alternation. Bruno could also use multiple applications of the same mode of action over a defined period of time before switching to another. This is typically around a month and is called a window or block strategy. Application windows are normally calculated based on the time it takes for the pest insects to develop and reproduce. This is known as generation time. With this information, Bruno visits his local retailer to buy the new insecticides. But he's immediately faced with a challenge. How does he find out what mode of action a product has? 
Retailer Zach explains that in many cases, insecticide products clearly display the mode of action employed, represented by a code. He shows Bruno four different insecticides for controlling aphid pests, each with a different mode of action. To prevent resistance, products with different numbers should be used. For instance, Bruno could begin with number 23, then switch to 9B or 1A for the next application. Letters after a specific mode of action indicate chemical and structural differences between insecticides that have the same mode of action. These should only be used for resistance management if no other insecticides with different modes of action are available. Zach reminds Bruno to always follow the manufacturer's label recommendations. Importantly, Bruno also keeps in mind that insects are mobile, so it's crucial to avoid products for which resistance has been reported in nearby areas. Zach encourages Bruno to work with other local farmers, so they can share knowledge to help combat the threat of insect resistance together. In addition, Bruno discovers he can take other actions to control insects and reduce the cost of crop production. This is often referred to as Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. Using natural insect predators, removing old plants and rotating other crops that do not host the same insects are all ways to aid management. For more information on mode of action and resistance prevention, please visit irac-online.org. Okay, let me just get back to my presentation. Um, I saw there were some questions on getting the videos and the links. Um, I will also include it at the end, but um, uh, the, the videos are on the IRAC website. So you're welcome to go and get it from there. And it's also, as you've seen, I've been playing it from YouTube, so you can also access it there. Okay, so in the video, they've also talked about window applications, and we've mentioned it several times. So what is a window application? Even now we went back. Okay. So a window of insecticide application is the period of time in which insect in which insecticides with the same mode of action can be applied to a crop or defined geographic area, also referred to as a block application. So in essence, it's a time period in which we can apply the same mode of action without compromising resistance management. The duration of an application window is defined by either the generation time of the target insect or the duration of residual control provided by a single application of insecticide if it exceeds the generation time of the target insect. So for example, if an insecticide after we've made an application, say for example, it's the residues stay there and the insecticide stays active, often for um, systemic compounds it will be longer, then for example if it's uh, more than 30 days, um, but we'll get to that, so 30 days is usually what we um, define as an application window for certain pests, but it can also be less for insects with um, shorter generation times. But if your application of your insecticide has a longer residual control than that generation time of the insect, then you will use that instead as an application window because the insecticide is active for that amount of time. Okay, so usually it's based on the generation time of the insect though. And um, the generation time is in essence the time it takes to complete one generation under normal conditions for an insect. So for the insect to go through its whole phase from adult eggs, larvae, pupa to the next phase. So an adult to an adult in the next generation. And um, usually this will be uh, around 30 days depending on temperature. Okay, so the generation time of an insect, of a target insect can vary depending on the temperature. So if it's hotter, then the, the generation time will decrease. So insects are, um, don't generate their own heat. So obviously if it's hotter outside, then um, they can reproduce quicker. And uh, other factors may also contribute to generation time. 
So if accurate information is not available, then IREC recommends to use generalized windows, usually recommending 30 day windows as most insects will have completed their life cycle within 30 days. However, 15 days can be used for pests with shorter life cycles, such as aphids and mites. In the case of insects with very long generation times, um, such as soil pests, the whole cropping cycle can also be considered the application window for that pest, with rotations to other modes of action recommended in the following cropping cycle. So this is usually for, for occasion. These mutations may result can also be used like uh, vegetables uh, or something like lettuce, for example. Some insecticides provide long periods of pest control that may exceed a single generation of the target insect, as we've mentioned. When this occurs, the duration of the residual effects of a single application of the insecticide is considered the application window. And so why is an application window based on the generation time of an insect? So as we've mentioned, insecticide resistance occurs when a genetic mutation confers a reduced susceptibility to an insecticide. And then if that insect reproduces and that mutation is passed on to its offspring in the following generation, then we select for resistance. So the principles of resistance management is to minimize the number of generations of an insect that's exposed to the same insecticide by ensuring that growers switch to insecticides with a different mode of action. So when we implement application windows based on generation time, growers can ensure that the chances of sequential generations being exposed to the same mode of action are reduced. So that poses the question, why not just make sure that the next insecticide application is of a different mode of action? So this can also be used. Um, direct rotation of insecticides with different modes of action is also a good resistance management strategy. However, it can become challenging to implement. So um, it could mean that growers have to purchase several different insecticides, or it could mean that if the rotation cycle is too short, sequential insect generations get treated with the same mode of action. So to give you an example, in example one, we have a window application of 30 days and we use mode of action one two times in that window and then we switch over to mode of action two in the next window. If we look at example two, we've used mode of action one, then mode of action two and then mode of action three. So in the first window, we've used two mode of action action. So now in window two, we cannot apply mode of action one or mode of action two. So the problem comes in that if you don't have enough products registered for that use, then it's more difficult to not expose consecutive generations to a mode of action. So that is why we usually say use a window period of 30 days and apply your mode of action in that window and then switch to another mode of action just to make it easier and not to expose consecutive generations. So then the question is posed, don't some insects have overlapping generations? So not all insects synchronize their life cycle so that they are all at the same life stage at the same time. Eggs, larvae, pupa, and adults may all be present at the same time for some insect pests. So by having windows based on generation time, it means that no matter the life stage, the next generation of each individual insect will be exposed to a different mode of action. So if an ins insecticide is applied in window one to plants that are infested with both adults and nymphs, by the time both the nymphs and adults have gone through their life cycle, which is approximately 30 days, they will have entered application window two when insecticide with an alternative mode of action will be applied. So this still prevents sequential generations being exposed to the same mode of action, irrespective of the life stage of the insect at the time of application. 
so to show this in a more schematic way. So for example, we have macadamias and we have a stink bug and we will have, um, so this graph shows the generation time when the, the stink bugs are adults. So we will have a 30 day application window in the first um, generation period and then another application window in the next generation period. So for that 30 days, we're applying the same mode of action. But now there's different insects present in the orchard that's adults at different stages or they're adults at a different time than the other adults in which we've now made our application window. But because they still have a 30 day generation time, even if our application window stretches from when one insect was an egg to an adult, then even if we now look at a larvae to the next 30 days that that insect is larvae again, applying the insecticide to different generations if we keep to a 30 day application window, no matter of the stage of the insect at the time of the application. To show it a bit easier maybe. Um, so yeah, you can see you have an insect with different life stages and in 30 days it completes its life stage to from adult to adult, generation one, generation two, generation three. However, at the same time, you will also have uh, different insects present that are adults at a different time than your other generation that we've had in the top line. So even if we have an application window, we have three application windows. So if we apply mode of action one in our first window, mode of action two in our second window, and mode of action three in our third window, then even if we stick to 30 days, even if they have overlapping generations. So this is just another exiting a different mode of action for each generation. Hope that makes sense. Okay, but then it becomes complicated because we've now looked at one insect and multiple generations of one insect. However, we all know that in practice that we don't just have one insect that we need to control in any crop system. So this takes a bit of planning, but if you know the crop that you're working on and you know the pests that usually come in, and you also know more or less when they come in, we can work out a resistance spray program so that we still have different application windows and using this specific insecticides in those windows for the specific insects that are present at the time. So this is also important to remember is because we will have different insects on our crop, we need to still, even if you're controlling different insects, you can't expose consecutive generations of different insects to the same mode of action. So if we have, for example, uh, the corn rootworm and we need to apply, for example, uh, a diamide in um, application one, then for fall armyworm, we can't use a diamide in, in window two, even though we apply the diamide for corn rootworm here, we won't be able to use it for full army worm in our second window because we've used it already in the first window. And even if it's for different pests, it will still be present on the same crop and the same insects will still be exposed to it. So it takes a bit of planning, but then you'll have to go sit um, before your cropping cycle starts to work out when you can apply which mode of action so that you can get the best efficacy out of all of the products that you use. Okay, and as we've mentioned, for short season crops, uh, sometimes your window can be your whole cropping cycle, uh, especially if your crop cycle is short. Um, 
like for example lettuce uh, if the growth period is 40 days and we usually use 30 days, then we can just consider the whole cropping cycle as a window. And then in the next cropping cycle, we can use a different mode of action. Okay, so just to give you an example of um, what we mean by the applications um, for different insects, that shouldn't influence one another. Um, IREC South Africa has um, worked on this resistance statement that needs to be included on our labels for abamectin and imamectin benzoate. So both these products belong to IREC mode of action group six. However, they target very different pests. So abamectin is usually used to control thrips and mites whereas imamectin benzoates are usually used to control lepidopteran pests. So maybe when you're working out a spray program, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be that obvious that these um, two molecules have the same mode of action. So um, we are proposing the, the following statement to be included on all of these products. Um, and I'm just gonna read parts of it. So. Uh, although these active ingredients have the same mode of action, they target different pests whose life cycles often overlap. So to delay the onset of resistance, these insecticides may not be applied within 30 days of each other. If an application of abamectin is made, an application of imamectin benzoate can only be made 30 days thereafter and vice versa. So in essence, even if they target different pests and we use them for different pests in the cropping cycle, we still need to think of resistance management when working out our spray program. However, abamectin and imamectin benzoate can be used in the same application window, but they cannot be incorporated into consecutive windows. Okay. So this poses the question, is reduced efficacy always resistance? So we often get people claiming resistance easily, using a product in the field, um, and letting us know that, no, there's definitely resistance development. But can we always say this? So sometimes reduced efficacy is observed in the field, but this does not necessarily mean that there's resistance. Resistance needs to be tested according to standardized methods to ensure results are comparable over space and time. Resistance studies to confirm resistance are lab-based, and this is to decrease variables associated with field applications. So there can be numerous reasons why efficacy is reduced in the field. For example, the spray volumes used, deposition, tank mixtures that are not compatible, drift if you're applying in windy conditions, equipment used, environmental fa factors. There are many different reasons why we can't just take field data and say resistance have developed. So how do we test for resistance? So reliable data on resistance rather than anecdotal reports or of successful resistance management. And key to this is the availability of sound baseline data on the susceptibility of the target pest to the insecticide or acaricide. Acaricide ju is just for, for those, well, I think everyone knows, but it's acari is mites. And they are usually also grouped with insecticides. Okay, so what is baseline data? So baseline data can be defined as data obtained from a strain or several strains with no history of selection with the toxicant or related toxicants showing cross resistance. So baseline data can also be gathered even if a molecule is not new, but if a pest species is newly exposed to the insecticide such as when a new pest invades the country and the pest would not have been previously exposed to the molecule. So the results from varied test methods may not be comparable as they may measure different parameters and this can lead to difficulties over the interpretation of monitoring data. 
So this just to stand still a bit on baseline data, as this is very important for resistance studies. When an insecticide molecule is first developed, the efficacy of the insecticide is evaluated against target pests to determine the susceptibility of the pest to that specific insecticide. Over time, as the molecule is used in the field, resistance may start to develop. So in order to determine whether reduced efficacy can be attributed to resistance development, susceptibility data needs to be compared to the initial susceptibility of the insect when the molecule was first introduced onto the market. So therefore, susceptibility data from resistance studies need to be compared to initial baseline studies to confirm resistance. So usually um, when a molecule is developed, the, de the company who's developed the molecule will do baseline studies to determine the susceptibility of an insect to that specific molecule. But obviously, if an insect does not occur in the country where the molecule is developed, there wouldn't necessarily be baseline data. Um, but uh, we have other ways to also um, report resistance. So if no baseline data is available, we suspect resistance development if the concentration of the insecticide needed to kill 80% of the population by increasing the target pest called C80 value, which stands for the lethal concentration. So if that is higher than the recommended dosage on the insecticide label. So remember at the beginning of the presentation, we said that um, we need at least 80% control to say that an insecticide is effective. So if we get an LC80 value that is higher than the recommended dosage on the insecticide label, we will get um, less than 80% control when the product is used. And that will lead to control failures in the field. We cannot rely on this. It can also be gathered by using insect colonies that have been reared in a laboratory setting for many generations that have not been exposed to insecticides. So if you have a colony and you've kept, in, kept insects away from insecticides, then these insects didn't have any selection pressure to develop resistance, so they can also potentially be used to gather baseline data. Okay, so in order to ensure results from these studies are comparable over time and space, we use, have to use the same methods over time to ensure that it's comparable. So methods are standardized and published on the IRAC website. These methods are developed by IRAC International, which consists of the representative companies um, that develop new molecules. The methods are specific to the type of insecticide and the insect. Obviously, insects have different ways of um, being exposed to insecticides, and insecticides also have different mode of actions and um, ways that they are used. For example, a contact insecticide versus a systemic would be tested differently. So IRAC International will continuously develop new methods as the need arises. So if you go to the IRAC website and you click on test methods, you will see that there's a whole library of test methods with different um, specific target pests and molecules uh, that you can use to test for insecticide resistance. Okay, so I'm going to uh, give you some information on a case study from South Africa um, on the potato tuber moth. So um, this data belongs to Potato South Africa and the Northwest University who initiated resistance studies against the potato tuber moth um, in the last few years. Okay, so potato farmers in South Africa were experiencing reduced efficacy with various insecticides that were registered for the control of the pest um, in South Africa. So Potato South Africa, in collaboration with the Northwest University, 
and lead by Prof. Annaline Duplessy, or Prof. Takis, as many of you would know her, initiated persistent studies to investigate whether the reduced efficacy can be attributed to resistance development. Okay, so it's um, very costly to do resistance studies. Um, so even though I'm just going to give a brief background of what was done, um, I just want to make the point that it's way more complicated um, than you might think. And uh, a lot of insects have to be tested. And um, yeah, it's, it's very expensive. So we couldn't test all of the insecticides. But the insecticides that were included in the study were selected by some of the farmers in the main potato production areas. So the insecticides tested were Ozenfos methyl, which belongs to group 1b, Lambda salatrin, which belongs to group 3a, Lufeneron, belonging to group 15, and Indoxacarb, belonging to IREG Medifaction group 22a. Okay, so populations were collected from three localities in South Africa that are the main potato production areas, um, and that was Tamburg, Polokwane, and Faldruf. Okay, so this is the method from um, IREC International's website. So the IREC susceptibility test method 22 was used to test susceptibility of the potato tuber moss larvae to registered insecticides. However, you will see that it says the species is tuta absoluta. Because no method has been developed by IRAC for potato tuber moss resistance testing, um, we decided to use the one that was created for tuta absoluta. And um, the reason for that is tuta absoluta was recently reinstated as Thermia absoluta, which is the same genus as potato tuber moth. Therefore, these species fall in the same genus and are very closely related. And I'm saying reinstated because tuta absoluta used to be Thermia absoluta and it was changed to tuta absoluta. And now it's once again classified as Thermia absoluta. And Thermia is the same genus as potato tuber moth, which is Thermia operculela. Okay, so firstly, you have to collect the insects from the different sites. So tubers were collected from the identified locations and kept in cages, and moths emerged were collected and transferred to rearing cages. Eggs were laid, laid were kept in the rearing room um, to get larvae. The susceptibility of neonate larvae that emerged from these eggs was tested to commercial formulations of the insecticides identified. So neonate larvae are newly emerged larvae. And um, I think if I remember correctly, Prof. Taki said they used neonate larvae, even though the, the protocol stipulated that you can use uh, a later larval in stage. So the the Instar that was used was actually more susceptible to, or let me rephrase, the size of the larvae are important for susceptibility testing. So if you use older larvae, then they will be less susceptible to an insecticide. And if you use smaller larvae, they are more susceptible to the insecticide. So the protocol stipulated larger larvae to be used. However, they used neonate larvae, which is newly emerged larvae, um, because it was just easier to, to find the, the larvae because they are tiny and they just disappear. But this would also mean that the concentrations needed to kill those insects should actually be less because it's smaller larvae. Okay, so the insects used in resistance studies cannot be reared in the lab for many generations as they may lose their resistance traits. So you'd remember that we said you can do baseline resistance studies with insects that have been kept in lab colonies for many generations because they tend to lose 
resistance traits as they have no exposure to insecticides, they wouldn't select for resistance. The video. We have to, as soon as you've collected the insects from the field, you can only rear them for one or two generations to test them. After that, you'll have to go and collect new larvae from the field. So the field collected insects should be reared to get uniform sized larvae that can be tested and also to ensure other stresses stresses are removed so you cannot use the insects directly from the field because they would have been exposed to different um, things that could have perhaps affected their um, fitness so you have to rear them in the lab for generation to get um, fit insects and also that they're all the same size okay so the procedure to follow Potato leaf pieces were dipped into beakers containing an insecticide at a specific concentration. These leaf pieces were then placed in bioassay trays and two larvae were transferred onto each leaf piece. The mortality of these larvae were recorded 72 hours later and a total number of 96 larvae per concentration per insecticide was tested and at least eight concentrations were used per test. So this is just uh, pictures of more or less what was done. So um, you can see in the beakers, that's the different concentrations of the insecticide to which the larvae were exposed to. And um, this is the bioassay with leaf pieces and the neonate larvae that were then placed in these wells and left there for 72 hours to report mortality. Okay, mortality data was statistically analyzed and the likelihood that control failure may occur after the use of a specific insecticide was assessed by comparing the estimated LC80 value. So as I mentioned, if we don't have baseline resistance data, which in this case we didn't, we look at the LC80 value and we say that if we, um, if the concentration needed to kill 80% of the population is um, higher than the recommended rates on the label, then we can expect control failures in the field. Where the estimated LC80 was higher than the recommended label of the commercial formulation, control failure is expected. Okay, the results are provided, assuming that a spray volume of 500 liters per hectare was used. The recommended dosage for each of the respective insecticide uh, was calculated and expressed in parts per million. Okay, so the results of the study were quite interesting. So for arsen force methyl, uh, just to show you in the um, left-hand corner, yeah, under the, the um, active ingredient name, you can say, you can see the recommended rate if you use 500 liters per hectare spray volume should be 500 parts per million. So that is what's stipulated on the label. So if you look at the, the LC80 value, uh, let's use Tom Burke for example, it's 581 parts per million is needed to achieve 80% control or kill 80% of the population. So therefore, if this number is higher than what is recommended on the label, which in this case it is, 581 parts per million compared to 500 parts per million, then we expect that we won't get efficient control when applying the insecticide. So for Tom Burke, because the LC80 value was higher than the recommended rate, we suspect resistance development and control failures to occur. In Polokwane, the lethal concentration to kill 80% of the population was 451 parts per million, which is less than 500 parts per million, but also fairly close. So at the moment, we will still get more than 80% control when using Ozenforce methyl 
to control the data tuber mass in polyguanine. In foul drift, the LC80 value was much higher, 719 parts per million, and um, the label recommendation is 500. So uh, resistance development is much higher in foul drift area than the other areas tested. For lambda cyaloplan, you can see the parts per million that's needed based on label recommendation is 12 parts per million. However, if we look at the LC80 values for all of the locations, it is much higher than 12 parts per million, meaning that we will see control failures in all of these locations. Proving the quality of his produce. The recommended rate, according to the label, is 80 parts per million. So if we look at the parts per million needed to control 80% of the population in our resistance studies, you will see it's way higher. So 80 is the recommended um, value, value on the, the label. However, we need 165 parts per million in Tomberg. 224 in Polokwane and 239 in Faldrift, showing us that we have um, definite resistance development against Lufeniron in all of these locations. For Indoxacarp, the news is a bit better. So we needed, um, according to the label recommended weight, you need 75 parts per million to achieve good control. And if we look at the LC80 values um, in all of these areas, they were far below 75 parts per million. So Indoxacarp was the only chemical tested for which all of, in all of the locations that still works effectively. Okay, so that was just a short summary of um, how we do resistance testing um, according to IRAC methods and um, the study was published in the CHIPS magazine, um, which is loaded at uh, on Potato South Africa's website. So you can always go read more on exactly what was done um, on in the CHIPS magazine. Okay, then we'll move on to GMO crops. So for GMO crops, we also need to do resistance management. So resistance management um, is needed because some of the GMO crops contain Bt proteins, um, which act as an insecticide. So I'm sure a lot of you that have worked with GMO crops before know that you have to plant a minimum of 5% unsprayed or 20% sprayed non-Bt maize in a refuge close to your Bt maize. So um, the reason for that is resistance management um, to ensure that we have susceptible individuals in the population so that we don't have uh, too high uh, selection pressure so that the resistant individuals can interbreed with susceptible individuals from the refuge population. So it's important to remember because Bt is incorporated into the GMO crop, it cannot be applied as an insecticide over the crop or on the refuge, because that would defeat the purpose of resistance management. So IRAC South Africa has um, developed spray programs looking at um, both conventional maize and Bt maize, and uh, we have some um, material loaded onto the IREC International website that you can also download and use. So this was when Fall Armyworm came into the country a few years ago. I think it was 2016. Um, the IREC group worked out a spray program and this one is specifically for Bt maize because you would control it differently on Bt maize versus conventional maize because you can use different mode of actions because of course you lose a mode of action if your BT is incorporated into your maize, you cannot use it in your spray program. Okay, and then we'll move on to nematicides. So um, 
nematodes and nematodes control fall under IRAC as well. Um, and we've also mentioned miticides, so uh, nematicides and miticides are also classified by IRAC. Uh, miticides are easy, they use the same classification scheme as insecticides, um, but we're mentioning nematicides specifically because they have a separate classification scheme that's also um, regulated or identified by IRAC International. So if a chemical can be used as both an insecticide and an amatocyte, as we've previously shown, then both of these classifications need to be displayed on the label. So at the moment, you might not have seen this on South African labels. Um, if you're in our IRAC group, you would be aware of it. Um, so we are busy implementing this, so it's a fairly new classification. So hopefully in the next few years, you would see nematicide classifications on your label in addition to the IREC mode of action classification. Okay, so this table shows us the different mode of actions for nematicides. And you will see also in the last column, that there's an IRAC or FRAC mode of action for some of these chemicals as well. So if you're going to use an nematicide and it's also classif classified as an insecticide or a fungicide, then you will include both of these mode of actions on your label. However, it's important to remember that you won't necessarily claim both of these uses on your label. So you obviously don't have to put the classification on the label if that is not a claim on the label. For example, if you have uh, a nematicide and you um, and it can also be used as an insecticide, but on your label there is no claim on your label to use it as an insecticide or to control any insects, only nematodes. Then you only need to include the nematicide the nematicide classification on that label. Okay, so then the question is, um, what is the nematicide resistance risk? Interestingly, there's no substantiated examples in literature from the last century documenting cases of significant tolerance shift or suspected resistance leading to failure of commercial agricultural nematicides against plant parasitic nematodes under natural field conditions. Therefore, the development of resistance in plant parasitic nematode species to nematicides under natural field conditions is currently unconfirmed and theoretically unlikely and poses a very low risk. Okay, so there are various different reasons for this. However, sometimes you will still find reduced efficacy of nematicides. So reduced performance of chemical nematicides can be caused by what is called enhanced microbial biodegradation, which is, um, that we will just refer to it as EMB. So essentially, EMB affects the level of product availability and the duration of exposure of plant parasitic nematodes to the product, thus reducing the apparent efficacy. So this means that um, microorganisms in the soil break down the chemical and then it's not available to control the plant parasitic nematodes. EMB is the result of adaptation and increase of microbial populations that break down a particular product, therefore changing the amount of available and or duration of exposure of plant parasitic nematodes. Therefore, this is not resistance of the nematode to the nematocyte, but it's more an, ad an adaptation of microbial populations to break down the chemical in the soil. Rotation of nematocytes from different chemical classes, as well as employing other control methods, should be considered. Okay, so at the end of the day for resistance development, Prevention is better than cure. Can resistance be reversed? 
So depending on the mode of resistance development and how traits are inherited from one generation to the next, resistance in a population may be reversible after withdrawing an insecticide. However, this is only possible if the whole population has not yet developed resistance and resistant individuals can still interbreed with susceptible individuals in the population. Like we mentioned, this is why we plant a refuge when we work with GMO crops so that we consistently have insect insects that are not exposed to the selection pressure of the insecticide or the killing mechanism so that the insects that do develop resistance can interbreed with the insects that have not been exposed to insecticides and hopefully do not have the resistant traits. The selection pressure imposed on the population by the insecticide should be removed to minimize the competitive advantage of resistant individuals in the population. So we cannot expect resistance to be reversed if we keep on using the same chemicals that we already see resistance development against. Unfortunately, if all insects in the population contain the resistance gene, resistance can no longer be reversed. Is resistance limited to synthetic chemicals? So insects have the potential to develop resistance to all forms of insecticides. So it doesn't matter whether it's synthetic or not. The potential to develop resistance, however, will increase with the increased selection pressure. So if an insecticide um, has a very um, good efficacy and it kills a lot of the insects, then that is usually a high selection pressure. So the chances of developing resistance against something with a high selection pressure is more than something with a low selection pressure. So at the end of the day, the best way to combat resistance is to use integrated pest management. So minimizing selection pressures and delaying the onset of resistance for insecticides can also be achieved by making use of integrated pest management, which considers all available techniques to reduce pest populations. So these methods include crop rotation, cultivar selection, planting uh, or genetically modified crops, monitoring pest populations, using biological controls, sterile insects, mating disruption. Um, when using chemicals, these should always be selectively and as part of an integrated resistance management program. So we should try and use, even if we use synthetic chemicals, we should try and monitor for pests before we use it and use it selectively. So in summary, for in effective insecticide resistance management, you have to know the mode of action of your insecticide so that you can um, do effective resistance management by incorporating window applications and not exposing consecutive generations to that same mode of action. And also important to know the mode of action is you have to apply the insecticide to the right um, stage of the insect. For example, when we looked at the insect growth regulators, you cannot use an insect growth regulator on an adult insect and think it will make a difference. So we avoid treating consecutive generations with ke chemicals that have the same mode of action. Never apply chemicals at reduced weight, rates or water volumes. Only apply chemicals at the recommended timing and number of applications. So um, reduced rates or water volumes, this is an important point, seeing as we mentioned sublethal concentrations. If an insect is exposed to sublethal concentrations, then the chances of resistance development is much higher. So if we use reduced water volumes, so for example, using chemicals in aerial sprays or drone applications where we drastically reduce water volumes if it's not registered as such can be risky and select for resistance. Okay, 
when making use of pesticide mixtures, um, we always apply active ingredients at their individually registered rates, also referring to sublethal concentrations that could increase resistance development. The best way to combat insecticide resistance management is using all different types of control measures to try and reduce the selection pressure on insects that's imposed by the use of insecticides. Okay, so a lot of extra information on um, insecticide resistance management can be found on the IRAC website. Um, we have a training center and you can click there. There's also, um, if you go to um, IRAC South Africa specific webpage, there's uh, documents and things that IRAC South Africa puts together that you can access there. Um, but there's different videos and spray programs and all kinds of information on the training center and the videos that I've showed in the presentation is also loaded there. Um, always interesting to go have a look. Anyone can access or download the information. Okay, so I wasn't busy for full three hours. <laughs> which I'm glad and I'm sure you're glad, um, but uh, there's still time to do your CPD online assessment. Um, if I understand correctly from Al Riza, you can now uh, do your CPD assessments for CPD points. Um, but anyway, as I said, there's more resources that you can find online on IRAC's website. And also, if you suspect insecticide resistance, please report it to the local Insecticide Resistance Action Committee of South Africa. Um, that is my email address. You're welcome to send information to me. Or if you have any questions after the presentation, uh, please send it along as well. Um, yeah, and anyone is always welcome to attend our IREC meetings. It's um, open to anyone that works in the agrochemical industry uh, or even researchers. So uh, please just let me know and I can include you on our mailing list to join for our next meeting that is in October. Okay, that is it from me. Um, thank you so much for your time and attending and um, please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you.